welcome to each of ages. Amen. Today is the second Sunday of the blessed month of Kiak, and uh, I'm sure the gospel is pretty familiar for a lot of us because not only we read it during the Feast of the Annunciation, but on the 29th of almost every Coptic month, um, as well as um, different times um, throughout the year. But even in the last night's praises, um, we read from the chapter. Um, but anyways, um, <clears throat> so today we the gospel here is the commemoration of the feast, um, even though it's not the feast today, of the Holy Annunciation. And not only is the Holy Annunciation the announcement of, of the birth of the Messiah, but more importantly, it's the, about the coming of the Savior of the world. Um, and so that's why in the order of the major feasts of the Lord, which pertain to our salvation, uh, chronologically, where does it fall in the seven? First, right? Um, so it's the beginning of the good news or the salvation of mankind, right? And so similar to, to what the Lord proclaimed um, about visiting uh, the house of Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house, right? This house meaning the entire world, the human race. Um, because why the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, all of us. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, as we know, the, the, the response of the Holy Virgin Mary when Archangel Gabriel to her came, came to her was what? How can this be? Um, and some people think she said this because she was surprised that an angel had visited her. But according to our tradition, we know, probably like it's almost undoubtedly, that she had many visitations of many angels in the past. So this was not a surprise. What was the thing that kind of shocked her? It was the words that he said about the incarnation of, of the Son of God from her. And so saying, Hail to you, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Right? So um, actually there's one eighth, eighth century um, uh, saintly father who wrote it is Gabriel who should stand in awe of Saint Mary and not Saint Mary in awe of Gabriel for she now ba bears in her womb the eternal son of God <clears throat> so um, as we were saying today um, or this gospel marks the new beginning or the renewal of man's relationship with God um, and the beginning of a lifelong or even an age-long process um, of salvation. And during this blessed time, it's beneficial for us to reevaluate and possibly redefine some of the common things that we're accustomed to doing and to saying. Um, like, for example, you know, the most common one when we say Merry Christmas, right? When you hear that, what is the first thing that you, you think of? Santa, gifts, trees, lights, right? Um, Gifts, eggnog, right? Gathering with family, gifts, right? We think a lot of these things, right? <clears throat> well, then what is the second or third or fourth? Like where? And we, each one of us has to answer this, answer this honestly. Um, where do I find my relationship with God and my salvation and my relationship with, with what he has done for me um, in the mix of all of this, right? <clears throat> Shouldn't I be thinking at least some part um, uh, of this. Um, so, or a, a different question, where do I picture myself um, location-wise when I hear these words? In, a, in, a, in the snow, in a cabin, with a fire, right? Um, who do I imagine myself with when I hear those words at Merry Christmas? With my loved ones. Well, what about God, <laughs> right? Do I ever imagine myself to be praying or praising or in a church when I hear the words Merry Christmas? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, here's here's another one. Um, happy holidays. Well, what does that mean? Actually, the word holiday comes from holy day, right? The holy day is what makes me happy. Um, so, but oftentimes when we hear that word, we we assume it it means the time of sin, right? Meaning, right? Gluttony. I I can eat whatever I want, or laziness. I don't have to go to work or to school or lest I can just um, relax a little bit in my self-control when it comes to um, 
the, the things out there or anger and gossip because I'm with family and friends. I could say and do whatever. I need to relax a little bit or materialism and covetousness um, with all the gifts and focusing on those things. <clears throat> so, and sometimes we use the, the unique word of tradition to, to, um, to explain why we deserve to do A, B, and C, right? <clears throat> and of course, this is the wrong use, or the misuse of this holy word. There are many customs and, and um, family traditions that we have, but there's also this word is used for the church things, right? So we shouldn't distinguish, or we should carefully distinguish the difference between what is holy tradition and what are just customs that we're used to doing. Um, because sometimes they conflict with each other. <clears throat> and that's why the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked the people um, for hyper-focusing on the customs of men and compared to worship with God. And that's why, uh, unfortunately, in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 7, uh, verse 6, 7, and 8, he says, um, the, the, in referencing Isaiah the prophet, he says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is from me, far from me. Hopefully that, that doesn't apply to us. And he says, and in vain, they worship me. So sometimes when we're saying Merry Christmas, we might be saying that in vain, right? Um, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so the main question, well, okay, um, here's another like analogy. Im imagine you had the best birthday party ever, right? So great that even um, days before and days after, your friends are talking about it. Um, and they said, uh, complimenting you, uh, we had so, so much fun at, at your party. Um, we sang all these songs about you and, um, and about your birth and how much we love you. And we exchanged gifts um, during this great time. Everyone was so happy and we had the best food and we decorated our houses and our streets and even invented new foods and songs um, and traditions because of this. <clears throat> um, we even took off from, from work and school to celebrate. Um, and then uh, the response is, oh, thank you so much. I'm very, I'm very appreciative. But just one request. Okay, what is that? Anything. Next time, can you just invite me, please? <laughs> um, I'd love to be there. Um, uh, you, don't, you don't have to get me anything. Um, actually, I'm the one who wants to give to you. Right, <clears throat> the Lord wants us to celebrate in the proper way so that He can give to us. Um, he's already given so much, right, as we know. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of people, or as many people say, the custom during these times is to take the Christ out of Christmas or to take the holiness out of the holy days, right? And so, in state, probably in about few years down the line, we won't be saying Merry Christmas anymore. People will say Merry Blankness, right? Or instead of Happy Holiday, Happy Days, right? Or Good Times. Instead of, instead of we need to reclaim this um, spiritually for, for what we mean and what we do when we celebrate this time. <clears throat> um, and so uh, this is the challenge before us. Um, that doesn't mean we don't celebrate. But we have to do it in the proper way and, and, with, and to make sure that our heart is in the right place. Um, so the Lord didn't rebuke them for praising him, but for doing something with their lips and not with their heart. Um, <clears throat> so in an attempt to become merry and happy, we've, we've unfortunately, a lot of us, um, including myself, venture further from the true source of happiness um, during this time. Um, and... Uh, so what should we focus on? Of course, the salvation, right? And incidentally, uh, I'm sure we mentioned this before, but the commemoration of the Holy Annunciation, which you celebrate on the 29th of the Blessed Month of Haram Had, or April 7th, um, is not the only thing we celebrate on that day. Historically, we celebrate something else. You want to know? There's another feast that actually fell on the same day in the calendar of the church. Holy Resurrection, right? Um, it also, it, and so, so we'll find it in the Synaxarium, um, but according to the custom of, of the, the tradition, we have to, even if that day falls on a weekday, we can't celebrate Resurrection on that day. We have to 
uh, we have its, it has its calculations and it has to be celebrated on a Sunday. Um, so the idea here that the church is, is, is trying to tell us is, is that, <clears throat> and it's not just that day of the year, right? We have many celebrations of the Annunciation, the Nativity, and the Resurrection uh, during the year, right? And even every, almost every Sunday, we celebrate the Resurrection as we know. So the church is saying Christ is our feast. Christ is our celebration. Um, it, and it doesn't matter even the day that we celebrate. Every day we should celebrate him. Um, <clears throat> And um, we remember the salvation, which is the greatest gift that anyone can receive um, and that God has given uh, to, to all of us. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the Lord's presence and power and gift is only truly felt by those who feel hungry. So the point is we need to feel hungry, right? Right. Christ came in the fullness of time. As we know, historically speaking, um, uh, we know the history in the Old Testament, right? And all of um, the relations that God had with his people, both good and bad, and the punishments that he, uh, he allowed them to experience as a consequence of their um, negative response to him and vice versa. And, but there was a period of time um, where after Malachi the prophet was written, for example, um, the book of Malachi the prophet, um, there was a few hundred years in between when Christ came. Um, and that was very intentional because God wanted the people to feel hungry and, and to feel the, to sense the darkness so that when the true light who shines upon every man comes into the world, everyone would recognize and see. Um, and uh, the same thing can be said of our relationship with God. We need to feel this hunger or else we would not understand the need for him. So sometimes, so, so the church does that, this, for example, before we partake of the Eucharist, right? Before communion, we have to be fasting. That's one reason why, right? Before we celebrate a great feast, we should fast before, even if it's only a day or, or so. Um, of course, not this one, this one is much longer. But like, for example, for the Feast of the Theophany, um, which is during the time of a lot of celebrations, as we'll, you'll see next month. Um, even though we're in a time of feasting, the day before the feast, we have to we have to fast. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's kind of like you know, imagine you prepared this beautiful meal for your child for months ahead of time, right? Researching and finding all the best ingredients and trying it just so that. The first time they taste it, they say, oh, that was the best thing in the world, right? And so you prepare it, and then you're ready to hand it to you. You say, open, op open up, and I'll feed you. And you see in their mouth just a ton of candy, right? It's like, what is this? I'm not going to give you all of this right now. No, we have to clean out what's inside before. Uh, and, and you have to be hungry in order for me to give you the good food. So you can recognize and accept it and keep it and ask for it later, right? So... Sometimes we have to do this in our spiritual life. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, that's why sometimes the discipline of God towards us in our personal life is important. Um, God de deals with us in many different ways, um, and we always expect the positive, but sometimes the negative is good. And that's why even in the church sometimes, um, um, especially during Passion Week, um, or the end of the year, um, we're sure the church is trying to ensure that at least this, this message is proclaimed. Um, and Moses, the prophet, when he writes the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 8, um, God is speaking to his people about the same idea. Um, so in, in verse 3, he says, um, <clears throat> God humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with the manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So the same idea, right? Um, God allows us to hunger so that we can seek the bread of life, right? And, and then later on in verse 5, it says, As a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. And in verse 16, he says, He made water flow for you from the flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with manna that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end to do you good. So the purpose is to do us good. 
um, but we need to be humbled and tested first before he bestows the goodness upon us. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's why also, anyone remember the psalm that we pray today? Listen, O daughter, and incline your ear here, right? Why? Let's, let's read it again. Psalm 44 says, Listen, O daughter, and see and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. We, we explained this, the, the meaning of the house here, right? Um, so that's the idea of the hunger. Forsake your people and your father's house. What can I be hungry? Or what can I um, eliminate from my life temporarily to feel that hunger for God so that he can bestow upon me his grace and his blessing, right? Um, <clears throat> and so... Um, the three magi had it perfectly, right? They saw the signs. They were looking for the signs, first of all. Then they saw them. Then they gave up everything and traveled uh, for probably months um, just to see and to offer something to the newborn king. Um, what, what have we done? <laughs> um, so m many consider us very fortunate <clears throat> that we have multiple celebrations of, of the nativity. Um, but I think every celebration we have to remember at least, you know, the Lord in some way or form. Um, so one last um, spiritual truth and say the more that we contemplate or we're thankful for the salvation of God and what he has done for me, the more I can experience the working of that salvation inside of me. Right. I'll say it again <clears throat> in a different way. The more we contemplate on the Savior and his salvation, the more we receive the blessings of that salvation, right? So that's the work that we have, is to think of how great the gift is, right? And we mentioned this before, like during the time of Thanksgiving. If, if we recognize and we're grateful for this great gift, then we experience the power of the gift. But um, if we have the candy in our mouth, we're not going to appreciate the great food. Um, we're going to just want candy. And then why am I sick? What is this? Like, um, no, I don't want anything else. The candy is great, but look what it's doing to me. <laughs> so um, you've heard of the thought, yeah, the phrase that it's the thought that counts, right? Um, it's not, but you, we can say this not just about the, the, the giver, but also the receiver. So we, not only does the giver think about what to give, but the receiver should think about how great the gift is and what the person who did it or... Um, plan for uh, the gift, what they had to go through in order to bring this gift, right? Um, I'm not talking about Christmas gifts. I'm talking about the Lord, right? So the more we think about what he has done for us, um, then um, we have the power of that salvation working in us. Um, <clears throat> so to conclude, um, we need a new beginning. Um, as the church always uses every fast or feast to remind us, we need a new beginning. Um, whether it's the New Year or a Christmas or any feast, this salvation is always the prime focus of, of uh, the church to, to bring to us. Um, <clears throat> and so um, how it's, it's last example, it's kind of like when you're playing, you know, a, a video game, right? And you die, right? You have, you have the choice. Right to go back to where to respawn where where you left off, right or a little bit before, so you don't make the same mistakes, right? Um, so this is what dying to the self kind of means, right? God gives us second and third and fourth chance, but we need to feel that okay, I'm starting fresh again, so that I'm not going to make the old mistakes again to the best of my ability, and we get closer to the finish line. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, I know I said this was the last thing, but the, the last quote from, from one of the fathers um, about the Lord, how, how the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who brings the old and the new together in himself. So St. John Chrysostom says, <clears throat> it was not without purpose that the Lord Christ humbled himself. His intention was to exalt us, right? He humbled himself to lift us up. He was born in the flesh so that you might be born in the spirit. Um, he was born of a woman so that you might be more than the son of a woman, hence the twofold birth because he was born, he has begotten of the Father before all ages, and he is um, uh, uh, 
he took flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary, right? So he says, um, he was being born of a woman was our part, but being born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of the Holy Spirit proclaims a birth that surpasses ours, right? This birth he promises as a gift from the Holy Spirit. He says, take his baptism, for example. It had something of the old and something of the new, right? Uh, um, being baptized by the prophet, St. John the, the Baptist, was a mark of the Old Testament, right? The descent of the Holy Spirit foreshadowed the new. Um, he said, it, he, so here's the example. He says, it was as though someone was standing in the gap between two persons at a distance from each other, bringing them together as one and uniting them by taking their hands, right? So Christ is the one who stands in the gap and connects the Old and the New Testament, but he also stands in the gap and unites heaven and earth, and he stands in the gap and he unites God and man. Um, <clears throat> and this is the reconciliation that we should be thankful for that not only happens between us and God, but gives us the power to do so with our fellow man. Um, <clears throat> and so, as St. Paul says, we are, as his children, should become ambassadors of this type of reconciliation. Um, so it is the time of celebration, but more importantly, it's the time of renewal, right? We take this opportunity to, to be in the proper sense of receiving the gift, recognizing it, thanking him for his great gift, and um, we, uh, like the receiver in, in, in a football game, right? You keep, you, you're, you're keeping your eye on the ball to receive um, so that once you do, you run as fast as you can. But imagine if you do that and you're almost at the finish line and you're looking at, oh, this, I'm, I'm really good. I'm really fast and no one's around me. And then you look down and you don't even see the ball, right? Sometimes we think we're doing a great job in our spiritual life and we're enduring temptation. There's no temptation because we're not running the race. We don't, we don't have the ball in our hand. We don't have Christ with us. Um, <clears throat> so um, we have to make sure that we have the, um, the, the one who needs everything for us. Um, and, and to conclude, as St. Jerome says, um, he said to the sinner, it was said, to, you are dust and to dust you shall return. But to the saint, it will be said, you are heaven and to heaven you shall be returned. And glory be to you now. We say.